If you can hear this message, listen closely. To the exiled, misunderstood, or upside down, this is your message of hope. When problems come, use them. When enemies persecute you, love them. These struggles are a fire, refining you into gold. Look around. You are not forgotten. You are not alone. Challenge what is expected of you. This world is not your home. You are different. Oh, oh there I am. Never mind. <laughs> if I were to ask you, uh, in a time of crisis where a community is struck by a natural disaster or a significant challenge, um, what, what do you think key factors in that community's uh, survival rates among people who are part of that community, but the recovery of that community? What, what do you think some of those key factors might be? I want you to think about what your guess might be. Uh, Daniel Aldrich, in 2005, moved his young family to the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. And uh, not long after they moved in, they heard on the, the weather reports the reality that Hurricane Katrina was fast approaching. Now, at the time that the hurricane was forecast and was barreling towards them, uh, there wasn't yet an evacuation order in place. So Daniel Aldrich and his family just decided, you know, they'll stay there and wait it out. Uh, not long after that, uh, late in one night, he got a knock at the door, and it was his next-door neighbor, who he hadn't really even met yet. And his next-door neighbor said, uh, Mr. Aldrich, he goes, uh, welcome to the neighborhood. He said, I-, I know that you're not from here, so you might not understand the reality of what this hurricane will mean. Even though there's not an evacuation order, you've got young kids, you and your family need to leave now. And he and his family did indeed evacuate after his neighbor said that, and they uh, avoided what would have been a, a horrible ordeal for their family based on where they were located. And Daniel Aldrich, he is actually a political scientist and an academic researcher, and he said something happened in that moment in his life. And his whole focus of research changed, and from there, he began to research how do neighbors help one another survive during crises? And one of the things that his research has demonstrated is that government aid is not a key fact, is not the key factor of survival during disasters. He said, rather, it's the personal ties in the community. So he's traveled all over the, over the world to research this. He went to India uh, when they were struck by the tsunami. And, and he said what he noticed in his research was that it wasn't the most wealthy or powerful who recovered the best. He said it was those who were most relationally connected who recovered best. He said it this way. He said, in other words, if you want to predict who will do well after a disaster, you look for the faces that keep showing up at weddings and funerals. These individuals were more involved in the local community. They knew who to go to, how to find someone to help them, and knew what help they could offer. He then uh, uh, traveled throughout Southeast Asia to look at how uh, other communities had been impacted by the tsunami. He noticed in one uh, Southeast Asian community, it was a small rural fishing village. Uh, This uh, particular village, you would have four or five fishermen who would, on one vessel together, go out and they would work together to harvest their catch and take it to market. After the tsunami, all of their boats, everything was destroyed, they had nothing. And a well-meaning nonprofit came into the village and they said, we'd like to give every farm or every fisherman in the, in the village a brand new boat. Now what happened and what they missed was that previously fishing had been a communal activity. You would have four or five fishermen working together to bring the catch from the sea to the market. They said what happened was after everyone got a boat, the fishermen no longer worked together and they said uh, trust broke down, fights broke out and the people in that community began to call it the second tsunami. It tore the community apart. And uh, Daniel Aldrich said it this way. He said, the problem was not that the experts didn't know how to help. He said, it's that the communities are not the sum of their roads and schools and malls. He said, communities are the sum of their relationships. I thought that was a powerful observation. He said, the community, it's the sum of their relationships. And in every instance where he's done academic research, he said, it's community, it's neighbors, it's, it's people who know and understand the lives of one another. He said, in fact, in Japan, he went there after the earthquake. He said neighbors were able to bring up the survival rate after the earthquake because they knew the layout of their neighbor's houses. And so when the houses collapsed in the earthquake, the neighbors knew exactly where to start digging to find their their fellow neighbors. He said, we have to recognize the significance and the power of relationships. 
Now, what Daniel Aldrich is researching from an academic perspective, we already know as believers, like the Bible teaches consistently the significance and the importance of community and of relationships. And so last week we talked about in 1 Peter, this question, how do we live as exiles and strangers? And I want to tweak that question for us today. And and I want to ask it this way. How does the church as a community live in exile? How does the church live in exile as a community? And what we have to recognize is that Peter is writing not to individuals. He is writing to a community of believers to encourage them together as exiles to live together. And in fact, it's the communal relationships of the church that keep us growing and moving forward. So let me recap where we've been. Previously, Peter talked about how as believers, we should have our hope fully set on Jesus, that we should live out our lives as holy people in awe of what God has done for us. This, for Peter, is foundational uh, to his letter to the believers in uh, what is modern-day Turkey, the believers that were scattered throughout Roman provinces. And and Peter defined for us last week what a holy life was, that holy living is a life made clean by Jesus, surrendered to God, and set apart for his purposes. So it's recognizing that in Jesus Christ, by his blood, we have been forgiven of our sins, we have been set free and set apart for God's purposes. So let me put up this um, summary of Peter's letter so far. Tyler, if you would put up that screen. So in Peter's letter, here's the flow of how he's writing. Part one of the letter is really the theology of what we believe as Christians. And it is that God has seen and saved his people. This is 1 Peter 1, 3. We've been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. From there, Peter wants to look at these three questions. How do we live based on what we believe? Last week, he looked at how do we live in our relationship with God? We've got to have our hope rightly set, live out a holy life in reverent fear. This week, we're going to look at how does what Jesus has done for us, how does that impact how we live in relationship with other believers? And then in the coming weeks, we'll look at how does that change how we live as a church in relation to a society that doesn't live according to the principles of the gospel. So as we pick up in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, we're going to look at a church community redefined as a holy and loving. First Peter 1, verse 2. He, Jesus, was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that each of you have sincere love for one another, love each other deeply from the heart. For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and the enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Did did you notice right at the beginning of this passage of scripture that Peter once again reaffirms for the believers where their hope should be set? In verse 21, he says, uh, Jesus has been raised from the dead and glorified. And he says, so our faith as a community and our hope are in him. And so for Peter, he comes back again to this reality that the thing that sets Christians apart is that our faith and our hope are rooted in Jesus. And for Peter, this is fundamentally important because a community that has a hope rightly set is a community rightly rooted. And it's a question of, as a community of believers, what is our foundation? And for Peter, he goes, our hope, our faith is in Jesus Christ. That is the foundation of everything that's going to follow in Peter's letter that we're going to talk about in just a second. And so for Peter too, it's the idea that a holy life lived out gives shape and definition to what does it mean to live as a community? What does it mean to be the church? And so Peter goes, we've set our hope rightly. We're living as a holy people. And those two realities will define what it is to live in Christian community. So let's look at what it means to live in Christian community as Peter begins by calling us to love for one another. Um, Tyler, if you can switch to my screen. Uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 22. He says, now, in other words, here's the next step. Now that you have purified yourselves, notice again, he brings back the language of holiness. To be holy is to be purified. It's to be made free of the sin that is in our life in Jesus Christ. And he says, you've done this by obeying the truth. Now, for Peter, obedience is a key theme of his letter. If you were to go back and reread all of chapter one, you'd see in one verse two, he says, we are called to be obedient to Jesus Christ. 
In 1 verse 14, he says, as obedient children, don't conform any longer to your evil desires. And so for Peter, the idea of obedience, this is not works related. That's not what he's saying. By obedience, he means you are conforming your life to the truth of the gospel. He says, when you've been made pure because you're walking according to the gospel, he says, so that. And that phrase, so that literally means here's the effect. When you've been made pure and right in Jesus, here's what that looks like. He says, you have sincere love for each other and you love one another deeply from the heart. And this phrase, deeply from the heart, is again, what it means to be sincere. And so for Peter, he says, because you've been saved, because your hope is in Jesus, because he has transformed you, that results in a life in which as the church, as the body of Christ, we we love one another with a love that he describes in two ways. He says, it's sincere. And when a love is sincere, it means it's genuine. It means it's not something that I'm pretending to be. It's not something that I'm trying hard to work up. So it's sincere. But Peter also says that we should love one another deeply. That, that, that word deeply can also mean fervently. That word deeply can also mean with endurance. When he talks about loving one another deeply, he means that this is the kind of love that can withstand some hard things. To, to use the language of Paul in Colossians 3, he, there he tells the believers to bear with one another. When we love one another deeply, it means we're willing to be patient. It means we're willing to bear with one another. It means we're willing to forgive one another because it is a love that is, has depth. It has roots in our heart and life rooted in the hope of Jesus Christ. And, and, and for Peter, this is so important because a community that is unified in love can handle the outward pressure of society because inwardly the community is cohesive. Does that make sense? It means when we love one another, society and culture can put pressure on us. Society and culture can persecute the believers as it was in the time of first Peter. But he goes, you're going to stand strong as a community because you are loving and encouraging and pouring into one another. And that allows the church to have staying power by the grace of Jesus Christ. But he, he, here's this question, right? I, I love what Peter said so far. Love one another deeply from the heart with sincerity. Who doesn't love that? What I struggle with is I go, Peter, how? Because if, if we're honest, sometimes y'all, we're tough to love, right? I mean, I'm tough to love. My wife would, would agree that at times I'm very tough to love. So it's, we, we can talk about love one another deeply with sincerity from the heart. But then there's the reality of this, right? There's the person that we struggle with, the one that annoys us. There's the person that's offended us. And the reality of living in lo- deep and sincere love for one another, that's the hard part. So for me, the question is, is how is this possible? So again, Peter speaks to this reality. and He says, you love one another deeply from the heart because you've been made new in the image of God. Let's look at this. Tyler, if you can go back to that text, please. He says in verse 23, uh, love one another deeply from the heart. In verse 23, for, in other words, because here's the reason why. This is the reason why you love one another deeply. He says, you have been born again. And and, and he says, you've been given new life in Jesus Christ. And by the way, this echoes back to what he said in one verse three, praise be to the God and father of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have been given new birth into a living hope. And church, sometimes uh, that, that phrase born again is like super churchy language, right? That we've got accustomed to. But when we talk about being born again, we mean that we have been given new life in Jesus Christ. You are not who you used to be. You have been born anew. You have been given new life in Jesus Christ. And and, and then he uses this biological metaphor. He says, you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. And we go, okay, what does he mean? When he talks about seed, he literally means like the genetic material of a father. He says, you've been born again and your spiritual DNA is not earthly. You've been born again and the the life of the father is in you. Now, here's this like reality of life. That's kind of funny, but also like, not sure what to do with is that I've noticed, especially the older I get, uh, sometimes it's, I'm standing a certain way. Maybe I'm, you know, holding my face or doing an expression and I'll go, oh my goodness, I am my father. You know, I'll, I'll say some and, and like dad jokes. I thought dad jokes were the worst. Now that I have three kids, I'm recycling my dad's dad jokes, Right. And I'll catch myself using a turn of phrase or or a a mannerism on my face. And I go, oh my goodness, that's what my dad used to do. I am becoming my father. And And the reason we look like our parents is because we share their DNA. 
And, and that DNA gives shape and gives form to our physical life. And, and Peter says, you've been born again, not of, in, of perishable seed. You've been born again with the DNA of God, our father. His spiritual life is in us. And so for Peter, he says, this love isn't something you have to try hard to work up. He says, no, no, you love because it's who you're becoming in Jesus Christ. And, and he tells them, right, you've been transformed. You've been made new. He says, through the living and the enduring word of God. And, and Peter several times comes back to this idea that the word of God endures. He says it again in verse 25. He says, the word of the Lord endures forever. And what he's telling the believers is that the gospel truth of Jesus Christ that has transformed us from the inside out to be a people of love, he says, this is a word that endures. It is a word of truth that can be trusted. And he says, this gospel truth is a word that is living. It is transformative. When you engage the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, it leaves us a changed people reflecting the image of our father. Notice too that Peter contrasts this. He says, and it's kind of a weird turn of phrase in his letter. He quotes from the Old Testament in verse 23, and he says, all people are like grass and their glory is like flowers of the field. Grass withers and flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And notice he says, people and their glory is gonna fall. It's gonna wither. He says, but God's truth endures forever. L let me pull you back into the world of the people he's writing to. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, Peter reminds us, he says, this community has suffered grief in all kinds of trials. This, this community that he's writing to, they have been persecuted by culture and society. They have faced persecution from Rome. And you can imagine this, this, this group of believers going, can we just not be in exile anymore? Do I, do I have to live as a foreigner or as a stranger? Can I just go back and fit into society? Did, did you know that in, in the early uh, culture, when Christianity was brand new, uh, some of the Roman culture, they thought Christians were cannibals because they talked about eating and drinking the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Christians were not welcomed into society. They were indeed exiles and strangers. What they believed about Jesus was not welcomed or accepted. And you can imagine these believers who'd face persecution going, can I just go back and live as a normal person? Can I just fit in? I'm tired of being persecuted. And Peter goes, no, no, no. Your life has been transformed. The society and people and the glory of power, that's going to fade away. But the word of God, the enduring gospel truth, that will endure forever. Hold fast to that which endures. And for Peter, that's why community is so important. He says, love one another because those things are gonna fade away, but you need the love and the encouragement and the support of godly community. Then Peter gets yeah, even more descriptive and practical and annoying, quite honestly. Uh, First Peter chapter two, verse one. He says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. And notice in verse one of chapter two, he says, therefore, because you've been transformed, because you've been made new, because you've been washed clean by Jesus, he goes, here's what your community should look like. You should get rid of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. These are things that for Peter will erode and break apart Christian community. Let's walk through this. By malice, he means this idea of anger, ill will, or holding a grudge towards another. Malice is this place of resentment and frustration. Maybe somebody hurts you or wounds you or offends you, and this anger grows up in you. And rather than loving, where love desires the flourishing and the well-being of another, malice goes, I'm angry. I don't care what happens to them. I just don't want to be near them. And we hold this sort of grudge against this person where we desire not their best, but we actually desire ill will for them. Next, Peter says, get rid of, of deceit. And to speaking, deceit is really about speaking untruth to another person with ulterior motives. It's, can I manipulate this person? It's, in some sense, deceit and hypocrisy are closely tied. Hypocrisy is a lack of integrity in which I play a part. I pretend to be something I'm not. And so malice and deceit and hypocrisy, these three are closely related because here's what happens. 
Somebody hurts you, wounds you, offended you, and you have malice, you have anger in your heart, but when you see them face to face, we pretend that we like them. We pretend to be nice to them. And, and, and can I say that this might be the besetting sin of the Midwest? And as Christians, we're really good at it, right? We use phrases like, oh, bless your heart, which is really Christian word language for, I don't really like you, but I don't know how to say it nicely, so bless your heart, right? <laughs> And, and in the Midwest, we'll, we'll engage in small talk. You know, how's your day? How, how is your corn yields? And all the while you're like, I cannot stand this person. Can I just be away from them? Right? And yet to their face, we play a role of someone who likes them, who cares for them, who's kind to them. And yet behind the scenes, we harbor anger and bitterness and resentment in our hearts. And what happens is that malice and deceit and hypocrisy, that becomes a sort of gangrene-like fungus that just tears apart community. Paul also says, get rid of envy. Envy is one that I think is really difficult for us because we have social media and we've got everybody's highlight reel. And so you're scrolling through Instagram and you're like, they went to Hawaii? They bought that truck? Their marriage is that healthy? Are they really that good? Right? And and, and we start to, in, in that place of envy and comparison, we're comparing their highlight reel to our behind the scenes going, my marriage is struggling and yet they seem happy, but yet I know that they're a terrible person. And so we start to play this comparison game and then, then we, we go into slander, right? And in slander, we actually start to speak evil of and insult them. We start to tear apart their, their uh, identity. We start to tear apart who they are as a person and we start to denigrate their character. I heard this phrase one time. Somebody said, beware of common enemy friends. Do you know what common enemy friends are? It's a person that you're friends with only because you both hate the same person. Right? We see it in the workplace, right? You have a manager that like is kind of struggling. And and so you have a coworker that you're like, this manager, what a dummy. Did you hear the decision that they made? That, that's going to be terrible. And we spend all of our time slandering the other person, but that's how we relate. And in church, it happens in churches too, right? We, we get together and go, man, did you see that person in church? Do you know what they did? Or we get together and we go, man, the pastor, did you, that sermon was terrible. Or, or they're just, uh, ah. and, we, and we, we talk about people and we're common enemy friends. Our only means of relating is that we both dislike the same person. But church, when you go back to the text, actually, Tyler, could you pop this up for me again? In chapter two, he says, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, and slander of every kind. He says, all, all malice. Does Peter say, hey, a little malice is cool? No, he says, get rid of it all. He says, deceit, get rid of it. Slander of every kind has no place. So here's the metaphor. When he says get rid of, that word rid means to cast off, to throw away like garbage. So imagine my garbage comes Monday morning. Imagine on Monday morning, I wheel out the green cart to the curb and I pull out a trash bag, throw it over my shoulder and decide it's going to work with me, right? That'd be so stupid, right? And yet I walk into the office and have a bag of garbage that's now dripping weird garbage juice down my back, right? Because that's what garbage does. And and I go to meetings and I sit at my desk and it's like the garbage stinks, right? And, And it's a burden. And I go, why am I carrying this thing? And finally, someone would be like, hey, bro, uh, your garbage smells real bad. You got to get rid of it. And it's like, oh, I forgot I was carrying this thing, but but yet it's polluted the environment of everything around me, right? And Peter goes, you need to get rid of malice, slander, envy, hypocrisy, and deceit. Throw it away. Cast it off. And y'all, some of us, we're carrying our garbage around, holding malice in our heart, slandering other people. And Peter's going, cast it off because it will pollute your community and tear relationships apart. And honestly, some of us just don't care. We'd rather be angry than recognize that we're tearing apart relationships. Can we be that honest? I'm tired of that. The older I get, the less time I have for malice and slander. Those things, like, throw those things aside. Church, let's live into what matters. That manager that you're slandering, you have no idea if they are having a marriage that's falling apart. Maybe they wrestle with insecurity. You have no idea what's happening behind the scenes of another person. All we know is that their faults inconvenience us. And so we lash out in anger and malice and slander and envy and hypocrisy. It's got to stop. Get rid of it, Peter says. Cast it off. Throw it aside. And he comes back to the how. Notice again in uh, verse 2. He says, like newborn babies, right? He uses this comparison. Crave pure spiritual milk. 
And, and here, I think Peter's helping us understand how we live into this kind of maturity. Because again, I, I don't know about you, church. I look at this. I, I'm not saying I have all of this on lockdown, right? I'm still in process. I'm still working on this, on this stuff. And so in chapter two, verse two, Peter comes back to the how. And he says, imagine that you're a newborn baby. Now, have, have you ever seen a newborn baby when they're hungry? It's like their whole world falls apart, right? They, they are screaming and they are crying. And if you're a parent, that is like the worst moment when like the bottle warmer, you're heating up the bottle and it's, it feels like eternity. When the baby is crying, the heating up process of a bottle slows down to a quarter speed. It's like a law of the universe, right? And that baby, they, they need the milk to survive. The milk is what sustains them. It's what grows them up into maturity. And so what Peter is saying here, he says, just like a newborn baby, they crave, they are crying out. They need that milk. He says, just like a newborn baby, crave and desire the things of Jesus, and some of us, we would rather stay rooted in malice, in hypocrisy, in envy, in slander. He goes, no, cast that away. Throw that aside. Crave the things of Jesus. Desire the things of God. In, 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 in the presence of God, the power of God, the word of God's truth, that is what will transform us and shape us and empower us to be a people who love one another deeply. So let me ask us this question. What do you need to get rid of? Because I know in a community this size, there's probably even someone in this room that you don't like. Now, don't look at them now, right? You don't need to look across the room and be like, back row, third from the left, I see you, right? But here's what I want to do. I want to give us like 20, 25 seconds of just silence. And I want you to, re to reflect on that question. Have you let malice grow in your heart? Is there a place where envy is taking root? Deceit, hypocrisy, slander? And there's something that even now the Spirit says you need to get rid of. You need to forgive that person. You need to let this thing go. You need to surrender that to me. And I'm gonna give us just 15, 20 seconds. Just pray about that for a moment. And church, I think we're gonna take communion in a second. I think we take communion in an unworthy manner when we celebrate the forgiveness of Jesus for us while holding malice in our heart for a brother and sister. Oof. But spend a couple minutes asking, Lord, what, what do you need me to get rid of in my life? Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. The Apostle Paul in Colossians 3. And so where Peter tells us what to get rid of, Paul tells us what to put on. And church, may it be said of us that we are a community who loves sincerely and deeply from the heart as a witness of our transformation in Jesus Christ.